So hello everyone, I'm Alina Nakhvi and I will be presenting my paper which is titled Politics of Identity and Symbolism, Interpreting the Paintings of Begum Samro. In this paper, I've tried to examine how gender archaeology can be used to study material culture associated with women in order to retrieve their voices as historical actors and to challenge the androcentric narratives surrounding them. This is a speaking archaeological project. Speaking archaeologically is an archaeological education group based in India. The aim of the organization is to involve more people in archaeological research and to give public archaeology an impetus in India. So moving on to the subject of my study, which is Begum Samru, I'll first provide a brief biographical account of her. So Begum Samru was born as Farzana sometime during the 1750s in Kotana village near Meerut, at a distance of 61.4 kilometers from the national capital Delhi. She was orphaned at, at, the age of, at the age of 10 and was left alone to send for herself on the streets of Delhi. It was during this period that she was spotted by a courtesan keeper from the nearby Chavri Bazaar, who took Farzana in her care. She was trained to become a courtesan. She was instructed in both music and dance as well as literature. It was during one of her evening performances in 1765 that she was spotted by Walter Reinhardt, an Austrian mercenary who was at that time under the service of the Jats. Reinhardt procured Farzana for himself. After coming under his service, Farzana dropped her profession as a courtesan and adopted the honorific title Begum, which was used to describe women of noble descent. Reinhardt joined the service of the Mughal Emperor Shah Alam II in 1773 and was granted the fief or Javir of Zaltana for the maintenance of his troops. All these years, Begum Samru was a constant companion of Reinhardt in his diplomatic and military related missions. Upon his death in 1778, Begum Samru inherited his army and establishment. Now, this event was of great significance because as for the established norms and customs, women could not directly inherit all the possessions of their late husbands. Uh, they were to be passed on to their sons. So, Reinhardt had a son from his first wife, but owing to her popularity and influence, Begum Samru was able to surpass his claim and inherited the army and establishment of, the, of her late husband. In 1781, she got herself baptized and converted to Catholicism. In 1803, she entered into the service of the British East India Company, whose power was uh, on the rise during this period. She died in the year 1836 as one of the richest and most influential women of her time. Despite her illustrious career, we hardly find any written records of her own. We do find stray references to her in colonial accounts, such as memoirs and letters of correspondence of the company officials. And there's also one poem dedicated to her by Lala Gopal Chand. But apart from that, there isn't much except for her material legacy. So this is the map. Yeah, so this is Chavdi Bazaar in Delhi. And this is uh, her principality, Sardhana, on the map of India. So placing Begum Samru in the socio-political and cultural context of 18th and 19th century Northern India. Now, this was a period of political turmoil with the gradual disintegration of the Mughal Empire and the rise of the independent powers such as uh, the Jats, the Sikhs, the Marathas, East India Company and Begum Samru herself. While women had always played an important role in the political affairs of the state during the Mughal period, two factors differentiated this period from the preceding one. Firstly, there was an increased vis uh, visibility and direct participation of women in public affairs. Secondly, these women were often former courtesans. Unlike the respected women of noble birth, courtesans were looked down upon owing to their profession as dancers and singers. This was because according to the Islamic law, uh, noble women had to follow parda or social seclusion and were not allowed to enter into public spaces. Women such as courtesans who did not follow or observe parda were seen as morally corrupt. Nonetheless, this allowed courtesans to gain access to spaces which were otherwise inaccessible to respectable women and hence allowed them to carve out a niche for themselves, which was both within and outside the highest echelons of society. This period was uh, also one of large, larger shifts in cultural preferences and aesthetics. Increasing power of women was reflected in the expansion of, the, of subject matter in paintings. The nude female body and erotic depictions became common themes. So the key issues that one, one encounters while trying to study women and especially courtesans during this period are, firstly, a dearth of written records. Secondly, androcentrism at the level of historical records, nature of historical inquiry and epistemology. And thirdly, the resultant invisibility of women as historical actors. 
Therefore, the aim of my research was to examine how feminist and gender archaeology can be used to challenge androcentric narratives of the past through an examination of material culture, that is paintings. The approach which I have adopted for the same is gender archaeology, which contends that gender relations are continuously made through the negotiation of rights and obligations in gendered spaces. In this process, material culture is used as a medium through which gender contact can be both expressed and experienced. Objects and spaces can be appropriated as sites for negotiating gendered identities. So Begum Sambhu's paintings can be classified under company style paintings. So before we analyze the paintings of Begum Sambhu, it is important to keep the following questions in mind. Whose agency are we trying to infer? Is it the artist or the subject? In this case, we are trying to infer the agency of Begum Sambhu, that is the subject. How is it that she wanted herself to be depicted and remembered for the years to come? Then why were the paintings commissioned? What purpose did they serve? Now this depended on the kind of painting that was being commissioned. For oval portraits, it was a popular practice among European officials and indigenous elites to exchange portraits as acts of diplomacy and the Begum was no exception. The second type were commemorative paintings, which as the name suggests, were painted to commemorate important events and were hung in audience halls and galleries. Uh, the next three are also important and interrelated questions. In what context or places were the paintings displayed? Who were its viewers? And what message was being conveyed? So coming to politics of identity, for the purpose of analysis, I have used two definitions of identity, which are as follows. Firstly, the state of having unique identifying characteristics held by no other person or thing, that is personality. Secondly, the process of identification with broader groups on the basis of socially sanctioned differences. Now, in the case of Begum Sambhu, at least two distinct stages of identity formation are discernible. The first one marked her transition from a courtesan to a noble woman. This involved her adopting the title Begum and also strictly observing the norms of Parda. The second stage can be seen after the death of Walter Reinhardt, which marked her transition from merely being a noble woman to a ruler, for which she again came out of Parda, though she did not completely abandon it. Now, these transitions are to some extent visible in paintings. How? With the conscious choice and appropriation of symbols and spaces in paintings, it is my contention that symbols and spaces were gendered and had specific socially understood meanings attached to them. Begum Sambhu appropriated these symbols to carve out a unique or exceptional identity for herself, unlike most of the other women of her period. So coming to painting number one, which I've analyzed in my paper, this is a miniature oval portrait of Begum Sambhu painted by artist Jeevan Ram. In this painting, we can see Begum Sambhu seated or standing in a straight posture. Her gaze is direct. She's holding a hookah pipe in her hand. Um, a hookah is an instrument used to vaporize and smoke flavored tobacco. She's wearing a bright yellow colored Kashmiri shawl, a pearl necklace and bracelets. She's also wearing a turban or a cap on her head. Behind her, one can see detailed drapings, the sky and the foliage. The cool tones in the background are in contrast to the warm colors of Begum's attire, thus emphasizing her persona. The second painting that I've analyzed in my paper is titled Begum Sambhu and Her Army. In this painting, we can see Begum Sambhu sitting on a decorated elephant with a servant behind her, holding an umbrella over her head. Behind her are three more decorated elephants, symbolizing her affluence. Below her is a unit of cavalrymen with guns. On either side of the army, we can see two columns of infantrymen. In front of her is a more casually grouped unit of infantrymen, followed by a row of camels with mounted guns and two European generals leading the army. We can also see oxen drawing cannons and carrying water tanks. So the third painting which I have analyzed is titled Begum Sambhu and Her Household. In this painting, we can see Begum Samru sitting on a chair surrounded by two rows of men in semicircular formation. The men have been differentiated on the basis of their ranks and status by using the principle of proximity to Begum Samru. Their sitting postures, that is, the most important men are seated on chairs, followed by men sitting on ground and men standing. Attire and accessories have also been used. On this basis, we can see that Begum Samru is the most important figure sitting right in the center of the painting holding a hookah. Uh, she's surrounded by two European officials and an indigenous elite on her side. Uh, there are four more important figures seated in the center of the painting and two other important European officials sitting on the right hand side of the painting. 
So coming to the symbols used in these paintings, the first is of course the turban or a cap, which serves two purposes, a practical one and a symbolic one. Practically, it was used by the Begum to cover her hair in accordance with the norms of Parda, ascribed for noble women. So even though she came out in the public spaces, she had her hair covered, something which was not the case for courtesans. Here we can see that Begum Samru was very conscious of her background. Turbans or caps more often than not were worn by noblemen and only in exceptional cases by very influential or privileged women. And hence, it is a muted symbol of power. So here we can see Begum Samru claiming that kind of a status for herself. The second symbol used by Begum is hukka. Now the hukka was introduced in the Indian subcontinent sometime during the 17th century and became an important instrument among elite men. The embellishments or the absence of presence absence of presence of hookah was a signifier of social status of individuals. In paintings, these were used to differentiate the subjects according to their ranks and significance. While important men were depicted smoking hookah in paintings in public settings, this was not the case for women. However, in Begum Samru's painting, we see her holding a hookah in her coat, which is very much a public setting and is used to distinguish her persona vis-a-vis -vis other men in the painting. The third and perhaps the most important symbol used by the Begum is Chhatri or the Royal Umbrella. Now for a very long time, this has been a symbol of sovereignty in the Indian subcontinent. Here one can find Begum Samru Chhatri declaring her status as a royalty or as an independent ruler. Similarly, coming to the spaces, the Darbar or the court and the field are both public spaces and hence male dominated or associated with masculinity. Women were more often than not associated with the harem or the zanana, uh, that is the household. However, Begum Samru can also be seen crossing the boundaries of these gendered spaces in her paintings. Therefore, these paintings demonstrate how she interacted with her larger surroundings and how this interaction was a continuous process, performed not only through individual actions, but also through creative expression or material culture. Therefore, to conclude, I would like to say that identities, and especially gendered identities, are highly malleable. Begum Samru's paintings reflect a conscious effort on her part to forge her identity as a ruler, a military commander, and a noble woman. The paintings are extremely informative about her individual agency as a subject and her self-representation in the absence of written records. The paintings, therefore, offer a relative advantage over literature, such as colonial accounts and other narratives, for retrieving her voice from oblivion and beating the androcentric narratives of the past. A similar approach can be applied to the paintings of other women of 18th and 19th century Northern India. There is a need for feminist and gender archeology span to work together simultaneously. Androcentric biases against women as historical actors also trickle down to their memory and material culture, leading to a relative negligence of these as sources of study. As a result, their material cultural objects and paintings have been marginalized and understudied. Hence, there is a pressing need to trace, identify, and study these objects from the critical lens of gender archaeology. The scope of such an approach is quite vast. At the end, I would heartily like to thank my research supervisor, Ms. Shriya Gautam, who constantly guided me throughout my research. This project could not have been possible without her. I would also like to express my gratitude towards Speaking Archaeologically and the panelists for providing me with the opportunity to undertake this project. Lastly, I would like to thank Team Casa for, for providing me with this platform to share my research. Here is a selected bibliography for your reference. Thank you.